From KC Born and Bred Ownership comes the most affordable and highest quality in Chiefs merchandise. For Chiefs fans, by Chiefs fans. Whether it's officially licensed items or unique custom conversation pieces, no matter the size, from grandbaby to grandparent, Noble Apparel has something for everyone. Best prices, best quality, Noble Apparel. Now with five convenient Kansas City locations. Off North Oak, Vivian, Holmes, Westport, and 68th Street. The ultimate fan experience awaits at Noble Apparel. Josie running left, cuts it back right, gets a breakaway. We'll be walking out of here the national champ. I expect nothing less. There goes Davis. Oh, my God. Davis is going to run it all the way back. Dobbs heaves it. They're punched up in the end zone. It's tipped up. It's caught. It is caught. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Saturday night in Death Valley. GASN Sports presents the Saturday Supremacy Podcast. Celebrating the passion, traditions, and pageantry surrounding college football Saturdays. Featuring weekly guests and hard-hitting analysis. And now, please welcome your hosts, Noah Groniger and Clint Schweitzer. You can call this the championship version of the Saturday Supremacy Podcast as the college football playoff national championship is upon us. That is a bit of a mouthful. I always thought the committee could have possibly come up with a better name for the championship game than just the national championship. Uh, I'd like something that rolls off the tongue a little better. But you know what? Here we are, LSU and Clemson. The collision course has happened, and it is time for these programs to explode off the launching pad um, on Bourbon Street in New Orleans. It's coming up Monday night. Noah? A week later than we are used to. Did you like this week break? Sort of the bye week in between the playoff and the championship game? I am not a fan. I'm not either. I was ready to roll. I was ready to get this thing underway. LSU, Clemson, the Battle of the Tigers. Let's get this thing going down there in the Superdome in Louisville. In New Orleans, Louisiana, kind of a home game there for LSU. I was ready to get this thing going. The week layoff, it kind of has me. I mean, I'm going to be excited when it's when the game starts, but just the whole lead up, I'm kind of I'm draining down. I'm going down. I'm not really thinking about it a lot, but we, we're thinking about it now. We're heading into the weekend. Monday's right around the corner. This national championship game, I am pumped. Absolutely are. I mean, you see what LSU and their record-setting offense was able to do to Oklahoma. And let's face it, Oklahoma's purpose in life is getting routed by an SEC team in round one of the college football playoff. That's why they are here. They win the Big 12 every year. It's a terrible league. And uh, even though you love what Jalen Hurts did, you love that story, they get to the playoff even though they had a loss to Kansas State. They barely beat Baylor twice. And they find themselves just run off the field by LSU. That says a lot to me. Um, Oklahoma, of course, two years ago did have a close playoff loss to Georgia. But other than that, uh, we saw what happened against Alabama last year. LSU now. Who will it be next year? Is it going to be Florida and Dan Mullen that comes in and beats Oklahoma by 40 points? Uh, Regardless, I'm so impressed. LSU's 14-0. They have six wins against top 10 opponents. We're going to talk to Michael Clayton coming up, our good friend, former LSU wide receiver, former All-SEC player. He has a song called Run, Tiger, Run. We're going to play some of that for you. He's so pumped about this team. He's been, uh, you know, had solid connections with Coach Ed O'Geron, who's been bringing him back uh, to speak to the team the last couple years, to attend games, to be on there on the sidelines. Michael Clayton, one of the great um, SEC uh, receivers of all time, one of the great LSU Tiger receivers of all time, going to be coming up. And Brinson Buckner, current Oakland Raiders um, defensive line coach played at Clemson defensive lineman uh, in the early 90s. So we're going to keep it equal here, but I can't quite hide my predictions. I'm going to get it out of the way early. LSU is going to win this game, and I think it's going to be by a lot of points. Really? I mean, that I don't really love Clemson's defense. And uh, of course, everyone was down on them all year. That close game against North Carolina, more interceptions for Trevor Lawrence than uh, thought coming into the year. Uh, but they've seen to, they're on a little roll here, and uh, they haven't really played anyone until Ohio State. And uh, that was a tough game. They had to come back late to win. They showed grit. They showed that championship mentality and toughness to come back and and fight through that adversity and win that game to get to this championship game. But I just think they're running into an absolute beast, a monster, and I don't. I just don't think they're ready for LSU. Not to mention a home game down there, Bourbon Street, New Orleans, Louisiana, the Superdome. I just think it's all too much for Clemson. I do too. And for me, Clemson showed a lot of grit. 
uh, Trevor Lawrence showed a lot of toughness uh, in that comeback win against Ohio State. It looked like they were just kind of flat and dead early. They come back to win the game. But that's the point. They had to play a real football game, albeit against a real team. LSU hasn't had to play many real football games. I know Alabama scored late to make that game 46-41. They traded blows with Florida for a while. But LSU has been so impressive all year, averaging over 550 yards of offense. They have the Heisman Trophy winner at quarterback. You know what the skill position players and what they bring with Jefferson. Uh, Edwards Hilaire, hopefully you know, back to um, you know close to full health or as full health as you can be with an injury like, like he's dealing with. This LSU team to me needs to start being recognized, especially if they are victorious on Monday, as one of the great teams in college football history. Is that so out of line? You think about 01 Miami, maybe 1995 Nebraska, 04 USC, some of these teams. This LSU team needs to be mentioned with that. When you do what they've done in the SEC, I don't think that you can understate the importance of, of what Joe Burrow has been able to do, what Ed O'Dron has been able to do, bringing in a Joe Brady to run this offense. Am I wrong here? Am I off base? Is this not one of the best college football teams in recent memory at the very least? I mean, it is as of right now, but they got to finish this sucker off. They got to yeah. finish it off and they got to finish it off in style. I think they need to win by at least two scores uh, to really put their stamp on this season and just to mark it down in history. Like Clemson, this dominant team going for three championships in four years, Dabo Sweeney, Trevor Lawrence, the best prospect since Andrew Luck and uh, Peyton Manning and John Elway. I mean, if you go out there and you dominate them and you win going away, I think that just cements it, solidifies it, puts a stamp in the ground. We are one of the best teams in college football history. Well, before we get into more of that with our first guest, Michael Clayton, I do want to ask you about the bowl season as a whole. We saw the Big 12 go 1-5, and had a dismal bowl season for a dismal conference. It works out perfectly. SEC goes 7-2. and What was your takeaways from this bowl season? Uh, to me, it felt like a, l- a lot of games that didn't that had little to no meaning. Uh, even like the, uh, the you know the Michigan and Alabama game kind of crept up on me. I'm like, I'm just kind of burnt out by then. I di- I know they kind of ruined New Year's Day again this year. Can you rate the bowl season as a whole for you? Uh, were you a fan? Did you have many games that stood out to me? It was just a lot of blah to me. Well, first of all, I'm a little, I feel a little embarrassed right now because. There was a bowl season? I right. I thought it was just the Final Four. I didn't know there were other games. I've missed it, and I'm, I'm embarrassed to admit that. But no, just going into this, I have no idea when these games are. I don't know who's playing. And to top it all, even if I know who's playing, where they're playing, when they're playing, I don't care. I just... Yeah. These games just have no meaning. I mean, we, we at least used to get these great matchups... The bowl seemed bigger. You knew when they were playing, when they were going to happen. I mean, I, di- I didn't miss the game, but I almost did, like you, the Alabama-Michigan game. And if not for me just being this psycho sports nut and checking on when it is, I could have easily just stayed on Netflix and let that game slip by and gone into the next day like, oh, I can't wait to watch Alabama-Michigan. Oh, I I missed it? I I, it just has no it's just gone so far down and do they do away with them what do they do to bring them back that's a question for someone else because i don't have answers but uh it was definitely lackluster and fell on its face for me this year i just had no clue what was going on i agree i mean albeit i was on a um a nine-day caribbean cruise so trying to keep those games uh you know without a phone without able to really keep track <laughs> I right, literally watched a game in a tiki hut in the water, actually, in Haiti. That's not a lie. Um, so, yeah, it was hard for me to keep track, and that didn't make it any easier. But to me, not a lot of star not, – nothing that really stood out to me. Uh, there were some moments. There were some games. I, you know, kind of enjoyed Georgia Baylor. Um, I enjoyed um, some, some of the matchups. I mean, later on, you had uh, Indiana and Tennessee was actually a low-key good game. I know. No one knew when that was. or knew, I can't remember, actually, the name of the bowl. Now, was it the Gator Bowl? See, that's just it. Like, you don't – there was a Red Box Bowl. I think there was a Cheez It Bowl. Like, it is overkill. We're going to ask Tim Brando, our good friend, about that maybe next season and try to get his take on it because it's a little too much uh, over our heads. But, but, you know, before we move on with this, let's go ahead and get the LSU perspective on, these, on uh, this game coming up here with our good friend Michael Clayton. He has um, authored a song, Run, Tiger, Run. You're hearing it now. Um, just sort of about the skill position players, this LSU team that has just gripped the nation, taken kind of the country by storm uh, as they are 14-0. Michael, welcome to the show, man. It has been great to have you on all season. 
We've had you on a few times. This LSU team just refuses uh, to die. They keep churning out these great performances. How's it going, my friend? I know there's a lot of excitement coming into Monday. How has everything been going with you, man? I'm good, man. I was in the air, man. I, my flight got canceled oh. this morning, and I had to fly to Fort Lauderdale, and I'm just arriving. So I was in the air. Hi. Wow. Well, no problem at all. Thanks for uh, thanks for getting back with us real quick. I know it's always stressful uh, trying to deal with air travel. I just came back from Fort Lauderdale myself after a cruise the other week, so I know exactly what you mean, man. But uh, the excitement level for you going into this Monday, Michael, we've had you on the show twice already. How excited are you going into this, man? Just as a, as a, as a former player and as an alum, what's your excitement level going into Monday, man? Oh, man, I'm excited. Extremely excited, you know, just the, the fact that, you know, I, I in 2003 we played in the national championship in the Superdome, and you know it was uh, when you're playing you don't you don't experience the the fan excitement and you know how crazy the city was, you know I, I was so exhausted after the game and just kind of hung out in our hotel room and but there was uh, hundreds of thousands of people on the streets of New Orleans celebrating our victory, so. To be back in this opportunity, um, you know, the guys playing so well, you know, got a special invite from Coach O, who invited a few of the coach, uh, the former players uh, to, to be with him and, and, and enjoy this ride. It's just a tremendous feeling, man, to know that we have once laid some groundwork for, for our university to get back to this stage. And everybody's embraced Coach O and the team that he's put together, obviously Joe Burrow, it's playing lights out with the guys around him playing lights out as well. And it's, uh, we got a great shot to, uh, to, to bring the fans in Louisiana something special, man. And it's great to be a part of it on this side as a former player. And um, I'm just honored to, to, to be back home. Man. Well, you mentioned it right there, Michael. And what kind of factor do you attribute uh, to this game, for all intents and purposes, being a home game, playing the Superdome in Louisiana right there? Oh, it's, it's, it's going to be huge. You know, we, we, we're going to take over the stadium. Um, everybody knows how uh, Death Valley gets at nighttime. And uh, this is going to be a uh, Death Valley on steroids. And not only are the people going to be loud in the stadium, but it's going to be a plethora and overflow of Tiger fans outside the stadium waiting to celebrate. So uh, I just appreciate Coach O's uh, mindset and the things that he's done with this team, focusing one game at a time. And uh, I'm really excited about how our guys have played in the big moments. We haven't seen LSU in past history play big in those big moments. And we've always fallen short, but the guys have just dominated in big moments. And I have to believe that these guys are fully prepared to take on the task at hand and uh, play in front of the home crowd is definitely going to give us the advantage. Well, LSU uh, defeats Oklahoma 63-28 to in the, in the first round of the college football playoff. They now have six wins over top ten teams this year, which is unprecedented, uh, averaging over 550 yards of offense this season. Joe Burrow's the Heisman winner. Is, is it time that, especially if LSU's able to win this game on Monday against Clemson, that we start looking at this LSU team as being one of the great college football teams in recent memory? You think back, 01 Miami, 04 USC. To me, this team is going to have to be recognized uh, up there because, I mean, if they finish 15-0 and with seven wins over top 10 teams, that's incredible right there. Yeah, well, we've done, we've done it in a great fashion. And, um, you know, it's, it's all happened this year. I remember uh, two years, two seasons ago going down to LSU and I spoke to the team about it being a journey. And uh, now that they finally finally arrived uh, in, in this moment, you know, I have to believe that this has been the track that they've been taking. This was expected under Coach O. This was a dream that they wanted to accomplish of changing the offensive round. And now that it's finally here, I mean, you would be foolish to not put this team amongst some of the greatest high-powered offenses that ever played a game in college football. And it's a compliment to not just Joe Burrow, but the players that are playing around them. We're running the football. And let me tell you this, our offensive line is nasty, and they're ready to play. They're physical, and they're moving the line of scrimmage. And I think that as a whole, this team definitely, without a doubt, uh, will be listed and, and be recognized as one of the most uh, dominant offenses to ever, ever play at LSU and in the country. Well, Michael, as a former wide receiver there at LSU, I feel like there's nobody better to ask this question to than yourself. 
each team has a trio of really talented wide receivers for LSU. It's Chase, Marshall, and Jefferson. And on Clemson's side, it's Higgins, Rogers, and Ross. I kind of want you to go in and talk about each trio and tell us which secondary you feel is better equipped to deal with that kind of firepower. Well, uh, I will say this. You know, at this moment, everybody is capable of making big plays. Um, with the LSU secondary, it, it was one of our weaknesses early in the season through halfway of the season, and we're finally starting to tackle well. We're finally start to uh, rally around the football, show up uh, in numbers and grows at the football. So our secondary has gotten better the past four or five games, and, you know, we've been waiting on that, and as a, as a former player, you evaluate, you know, your defense and say, hey, defense wins championships, and if we make it all the way, in, in, in order for us to win against Clemson, our defense has to lead the charge. Even though that our offense can score points, our defense has to be able to stop them, and I think that for the most part, our, our defense has come along well. Now, Clemson's defense, their, their defensive backs have been playing – fairly well all year. Uh, in my opinion, they, they, they're, they're stout guys. But one thing that LSU has, you know, in terms of their receivers, I mean, I love uh, I love Chase. I love Marshall. But let me tell you this kid, uh, Justin Jefferson, man, he is uh, – he's had my eye from the moment that he stepped on campus. He reminds me of uh, when I got an opportunity to watch Jarvis Landry play. He's a guy that plays the position at a high level. Uh, he's a he's a, a deceptive a guy who's very very fast. He can catch the ball in traffic. He's always quarterback friendly. I think that how those guys are coached kind of gives LSU the uh, the advantage because you know I got a chance to watch the LSU receivers you know for for three days before the season start and just knowing their technique, how they come back to the football, you know, uh, uh, and how they you know perfect uh, the route running craft. Is something that uh, you know that a lot of teams and a lot of coaches don't do, and they get that at LSU, and uh, they've shown themselves approved week in and week out that they can make dominant plays. So playing in front of a home crowd definitely gives uh, our offense more fuel to the fire, gives us more motivation to go out and make big plays. And I just got to hang my hat. You know, I'm I'm biased about my LSU Tigers, but I just think that this is the year that we're going to dominate. We expect to dominate, and it doesn't matter who we're playing against. Well, we've talked to you uh, in, in past episodes about your relationship with this LSU team and the, the things that Coach Ed Ogeron has done uh, you know, with the former players and bringing you guys back, and, and you specifically. You obviously have a connection with this team at your alma mater. You won a national title there. You were an all-SEC player there, and you've uh, released a song called Run, Tiger, Run, which we played a snippet of a couple weeks ago, and we're playing more of it in our intro for this week. Talk about the song yeah. and kind of how it came about and kind of what, what your plans are to do with it, uh, you know, aside from it playing on this podcast, it's, it's getting a lot of run here. We know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, uh, I'm, I'm, I launched my own show in March um, called Mike Up, and uh, it'll be launching on ABC here locally in, uh, in Tampa and looking to expand regionally. And uh, I, I have to create my own music because you, you, on TV you're not able to uh, play music that that is controlled by other artists. So, I was spending a lot of time with bands and in the studio creating uh, intro and outro music and just following my LSU Tigers. I just got an opportunity to kind of be creative. I'm not a rapper. That's not what I do, but I, you know, I'm a writer. Uh, I'm a content provider, and I just got an opportunity to expect our Tigers to be in this situation. As you said, as you said, you, 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 you played the song weeks ago. So I was expecting our LSU Tigers to be number one when we weren't number one. And it was just kind of fun just kind of promoting that locally in Tampa with all the LSU fans. Uh, just give people something to uh, enjoy, something that's different. You know, uh, uh, Dwayne Bowe is a rapper now, and uh, he was the guy who broke my record. He was a, uh, I was his mentor, and he, he had a great career at LSU. And uh, I just wanted to do something fun because I know, that, look, Joe Burrow, is uh, he's a bad boy. But listen, the lifeline on the other end is the lifeline, and that's the receivers. And as a former receiver, you just feel good uh, about how those guys are playing. And I just wanted to give those guys a tribute. You know, I mentioned in the, uh, in the song uh, about doing the gritty and Justin Jefferson early in the season, he was doing the gritty and the whole country was doing that dance. Alabama players were doing that dance. <laughs> 
but it's just something something to be uh, remembered, uh, captured by me as a former player. Just a fun, a fun, joyous moment um, that I get to share with the LSU fans. You know. Absolutely. So do we need to get our DVRs ready here, Michael? Because surely, <laughs> surely they have you performing Run Tiger Run at halftime, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, not, not, not yet. You, you know, I haven't done a national release yet. You guys have been a, been a blessing to uh, allow me to get some airplay. Uh, I don't know how many people have heard it over, over Twitter and all of that stuff. So I, it's really not for that, man. I, I wanted to make a video. Listen, I hired some... Uh, some chore- choreographers to make a little video about it. I just haven't released it yet. I wanted to uh, win the game before we actually release that video. So there's more things in the work to kind of have fun. Uh, and if it catches on, it catches on. If not, man, I just I just think it's a, it's a good intimate moment for all LSU fans. Yeah, absolutely it is. Uh, we, we really appreciate it. We really like it. In fact, I mean, we have a documentary, an SEC football documentary, and we'll talk to you. We'd love to use it in the film coming up to you. So we'll be talking about that. But last thing before we let you go, Michael, and we can't thank you enough for coming on with us uh, here right after just literally stepping off of a flight. We Clemson Tigers, Trevor Lawrence is undefeated in his career at Clemson. Uh, the time is now. We saw Clemson play a very hard-fought game against Ohio State. They're getting ready to take on the firepower, the Heisman Trophy winner, uh, kind of the darlings uh, of the college football season in LSU. What's your prediction? How does this game go? Who wins and what's the score? We're holding your feet to the fire here. Yes, uh, LSU will score over 50 points. Uh, Clemson will have to score 60 points to beat us. Uh, listen, Trevor Lawrence, uh, Trevor Lawrence is a, is a great quarterback. I have him pinged for 2021 to go to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, I think that, uh, this, this kid is tremendous, but I think that last week it took a lot of, a, a lot out of him. Uh, and he had to make a play for them to, to will themselves to win. And I just think that, you know, when you when you play a hard fought emotional game like that, uh, it takes a lot out of you. And I just think that you need to be on your P's and Q's, and you need to be fully healthy to beat our LSU Tigers. You know, we, we will score. Now I'm, I'm gonna put a 55, and this is crazy. It's gonna sound crazy, you know, but <laughs> 55 to 60. Our right, LSU Tigers take the bitter victory, and uh, all of Louisiana, especially uh, Bourbon Street, will be on fire with uh, real Tiger fans, the Tigers are the you. Michael, cannot wait for it. Monday is uh, just around the corner. Good luck to, uh, and everything. We're going to be in contact, man. Uh, we're right there with you. We're here in Missouri, but we are definitely uh, on the Tiger bandwagon with you, man, coming into this game. So uh, the LSU Tiger bandwagon, that is. Uh, can't confuse that. <laughs> with the Clemson Tigers, buddy. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll do it again. We'll talk more about the Bucks, some other offseason stuff, and, uh, and, and more along the lines of that uh, here down the road, man. Thank you so much for all you've done for us this year. Hey, guys. Anytime, man. Thank you. Well, there you have it from Michael Clayton. He expects 50-plus from the LSU Tigers. I don't know if I'm there yet. I, I, I think that I, I would have it more something like 41-24. So that, that's me. Uh, but, you know, Michael is very passionate about this, uh, this team, and uh, I love the stories he tells us about Ed Ogeron and the way he reacts to former players, brings him in. He's, done, he's talked to this team. I love it. I like what Michael has to say, and, you know, I think uh, it's G-E-A-U-X. When it comes to Tiger versus Tiger this this coming Monday, oh, absolutely, and I'd I'd probably go forty four to thirty. Uh, so I guess I have it a little bit closer game, but uh, LSU is going to score all day. I just there's a few players on that Clemson defense that just aren't going to be able to hold their water against just the plethora of weapons and Joe Burrow. Just there's no defense for a perfect throw. That's a cliche that people throw around, but it's really true for Joe Burrow and Joe Brady in this LSU offense. And uh, there's just not going to be many answers that that Clemson defense uh, is going to be able to come up with. And uh, Trevor Lawrence, I mean, Grant Delpit out there, Derek Stingley Jr. at corner for Clemson on that defense. I think they're going to have just enough to uh, pull away there at the end and uh, make this thing a little bit of a rout at the end when you just look at the final box score. Well, let's get the Clemson side of this uh, with our good friend Brinson Buckner. He is the current defensive line coach for the Oakland Raiders and, uh, of course, all ACC performer at Clemson back in the 90s. Brinson, welcome to the show, man. Huge game coming up Monday. We all know that. Uh, the level of excitement, though, has to be just through the roof, doesn't it? Yeah, it is. It's a great opportunity for the Tigers. You know, you're really excited for them, um, you know, especially coming off of last year and, you know, and all the expectations for this year. And, and they've steadily improved, you know, throughout the year. And, 
you know, you're just happy for them to get to this point because it's like the whole nation all of a sudden, Clemson became the bad guys. Everybody's waiting for them to lose or they're not winning by enough points or, or why the quarterback had, doesn't have a perfect passing rating and, and they can't do this, they can't do this, can't do that. But, you know, you're happy for them because Dabo Sweeney and his staff have really just got these guys focused on getting better every day and every time they went out. And they're peaking at the right time. And, you know, and here comes this mammoth opponent, you know, LSU from the monster SEC. And they got the Heisman Trophy winner. They have the Belitnikoff Award winner. They got number one picks left and right. You're going in their backyard. So, you know, this this is a great time to be a Clemson Tiger, you know. You know, everybody hates us. You know, we're the we're the probably the greatest underdogs in the history of college football. So it's a great time to be a Clemson Tiger and look forward to it Monday night. Well, Brenston, what did you make of that uh, early on the season, really throughout the season? Uh, Trevor Lawrence was having a few more interceptions than people were used to. You had that close game against Mac Brown, the North Carolina Tar Heels, and people are starting to question and doubt Clemson. And here you guys are in the national championship. I'm sure that's got to feel great. Yeah, it feels great, but you know, you know, last year Trevor, you know, coming on, taking the job, you know, when he did and leading him to a, a national title, you know, people put these lofty goals on people, and you mm-hmm. realize the guy was a true freshman. Yeah, there was going to be some bumps in the road. You know, you know, teams were going to start to learn him while he's learning himself. So, you know, it was it was frustrating for him, I know, but. We all know the talent that, that that he is. And, you know, as a Clemson fan, as a former Clemson player, you know, I just sit back and marvel that, you know, the guy's ability to to block out all the elevator music and continue to elevate to where he wanted to go. And, and then watching him the other night versus uh, Ohio State, you just seen a different gleam in his eyes. It's like he took another step in his, in, in his, in his growth spot where he's like, oh, my God, you know, you can start to see the – the Deshaun Watson qualities come out. Mm-hmm. When you start to see the great time, great big time football players come out. Where he put the team on his back and said, "Hey, we're we're not going to lose. I'm not going to let us lose this game." And so I'm I'm just happy to to be basking in this right now, and I can't wait to Monday night. Well, as an all former All ACC player at the University of Clemson, uh, playing for uh, Ken Hatfield there uh, in what proved to be his uh, final season, I believe at Clemson. Um, you know, you, uh, went through ups and downs, um, as, as part of the Clemson program, what is your level of pride right now? When you, when you see where the programs come, um, under Debo Swinney, two national championships. I mean, it really is hard to break into becoming a blue blood in college football and Clemson has managed to edge their way in, you know, into that conversation. What is your level of pride as, as a Clemson alum that, you know, that, that played at a high level with that program? Oh, it, it, it feels great, you know, because even going to Clemson, coming out of school, you know, we always looked at ourselves as a great program that was working our way up. You know, Danny Ford recruited me there. Unfortunately, things happened. He left. Hatfield came in, and we started off high, then we fell off. And the ACC, for whatever, never got that type of notoriety until Florida State jumped in. But then Dabo, you know, you fast forward, now the Dabo comes in, he has a plan. He builds the program the way he wants it to, to play. Now, the Clemson Paw is everywhere. And it's very, you know, it used to go from where you went to school at Clemson. Where is that? That's South Carolina. It's an hour and 50 minutes north of, of of Atlanta. It's an hour and 50 minutes south of Charlotte. So you had to almost direct people there, map quest them there. To now, they see the Paw, or they, or they see the orange and the purple, and they're like, oh, you went to Clemson. So it makes you feel good. Because Dabo has really put has really put this program on the map. Where now we were always prideful about our Clemson heritage, but now we walk around and the, and the Paul speaks for itself. Well, Brinston, everyone talks about that Clemson offense, Dabo Sweeney, Trevor Lawrence, as they should. But what can you tell us about Logan Rudolph, Tyler Davis, Niles Pinckney, Xavier Thomas, and and just how this Clemson defensive front stacks up to the dominant ones we've seen throughout the years? Well, it's a little bit different. You know, you, know, you look at those guys, you had three first-round draft picks, and I think four draft picks off the last defensive line that was there that was great. They you know, did something that's never been done at mm-hmm. Clemson. But you look at this group this year, they go by it a different way. And it's really, you take your hat off to them because that's a lot of pressure. 
No, you oh, replace yeah. Cleveland Farrell, Dexter Lawrence, Christian Wilkins. No, you have to try to replace the walk in those shoes and, and the expectations when you walk on that campus. Oh, y'all got to go dominate everybody in the country. You know, we're used to seeing it this way, but these guys have really put their own little twist on it. You know, you no, know, they're more quick, quick and fast with stunts and speed, and they work well together. Now, you don't see that natural bond that those other four or five guys have for the years of playing together, but you see this group starting to gel, and they do it in so many facets of ways. You know, it's different combinations. You got the young guys come in, and they're playing, and everybody plays their role to the max, and that's why they have a success this year. Well, you mentioned Cleland Farrell there, and talk about your role in evaluating him for the draft, uh, working with him this season, and your relationship with him as former Clemson Tigers. Uh, well, Cleveland, uh, evaluating Cleveland, you know, with that fourth pick, what we really wanted, we wanted somebody, of course, who could play football and be a, a great football player, but we were looking for a great person, a guy that we could build our leadership foundation around, a guy who's, who could be up front in front of this team. You know, you're never going to worry about him out in the media doing anything kind of crazy. He's going to bring his lunch pail in. He's going to work hard every day. He was going to love his teammates as well as love himself. And it was like a key foundational piece, and that's what's Cleveland Farrell for, for us. You know what I mean? You know, he's good on the football field, but people don't understand he's still learning learning the position and learning how to be a, a pro. And it was a great relationship. It just so happened to be, you know, I didn't pull for Cleveland because I went to Clemson. Mm-hmm. Cleveland just had to be the best person for the job, and he happened to go to Clemson. Yeah. So it just worked out that way. And it, it's just been a great relationship because – I think he looks up to me as as one of the big brothers that came to Clemson before he did and played the same position. And I look at him as a as a younger brother. I want him to be successful on and off the field. You know, we sit in the meeting room. We sit beside each other. You know, we talk about everything from from his mom, how his mom doing, how his family doing, how he's doing off the field. And it's really a real brotherhood type relationship. I just so happen to be his coach right now. Yeah. Well, Brinston, of course, I mean, you've been in coaching for the past decade plus. You're the current defensive line coach for the Raiders, as we talked about, coming in from Tampa Bay. And look, I mean, I don't know if you know this stat yet, but the Raiders had 13 sacks in 2018. You go all the way up to 32 in 2019. And I mean, we have no better place to point the finger than to you, my friend. You (laughs) were able to help bring this defensive line around. Um, And and the Raiders really, you know, with a chance to even make the playoffs, albeit a, a, a very small chance going into the last week. This team obviously got better, and what do you think the key was in uh, this defensive line getting more pressure and getting more sacks, creating more turnovers? This defense was ranked 14th overall, and it got better. How did you guys do it? Well, we just we just worked. You know, we said we mapped out a plan, and we was like, hey, if this team is going to be great, it's going to be great because of the guys in this defensive line room. And, and every day we set out to go out there and do the little things, right, from watching film to – you know, hustling from drill to drill to running off the field and, and start to build, try to build a culture in which Cleveland was a great part of because he comes from a, a team that's winning championships. So he sort of had that mental in him already. And that's what we try to do, you know, with the Raiders. And, and now I tried to build an atmosphere where guys cared, cared about each other off the field as much as on the field to build those special type relationships. And so now you can go out there and you can play and you can push one another, you know, Guys were able to correct one another, get on one another, and there wasn't no feelings involved because they had a bond outside of football. And we tried to attack it that way every day. And, you know, we had a saying in, in our room, the only person we got to be greater, greater than, the only person we got to be better than tomorrow is the person who was today. Yeah. And everybody took that every day. You come to work. You know, it's raining outside, work harder. You know, it's cold, work harder. We lose the game, work harder. So no ebbs and flows out there. It was just a steady climb. And what we're doing is trying to change that culture and get each guy to buy into it. And and this year, you know, we took the first step to land that foundation and looking to build upon it. Brinson, best of luck to you um, heading to, to Las Vegas next year. We'll see you a couple times next year. Chiefs and Raiders, man, looking forward to it. And uh, looking forward to Monday night, Clemson and LSU, man. Good luck with uh, with that as well. We'll be uh, cheering for you. Cheer for those Tigers, and best of luck, man. Thanks so much for joining us. I appreciate it. Go Tigers. You bet. Thanks a lot. Always an honor. Thanks. 
there you have it. We like to keep things equal here. Of course, we've made two SEC football documentaries, but even so, we've got an LSU perspective. We've got the Clemson perspective, and now it's go time. It's time to strap up the helmets and uh, make this thing happen on a Monday night in the Big Easy. Princeton seemed a little bit more confident, and he's so prideful. Uh, and you love to hear that from alums of schools, that how much pride they have and how much they take out of these wins and, and the prosperity of the program under Dabo Swinney. Brinston is a Clemson Tiger through and through, and I got to respect everything that he's done. And I respect him as a player and a coach, certainly. Oh, absolutely. And I love just kind of picking his brain there on the defensive line, how it's changed the years and how they had all those first rounders go in uh, Dexter Lawrence and uh, Cleland Farrell. And uh, so he's talking about this line, how it doesn't have that big name star power, those just numerous first rounders across the line. But they do it in a different way, but they are successful. They are going to be able to get pressure on Joe Burrow. Uh, but uh, in the end of the day, I just don't think it's going to be uh, be enough with this LSU. We've seen it all year long. We've seen them against the best competition in the SEC across the nation. Uh, Texas coming into the season, a lot of people uh, had up there, and uh, they dismantled them. I mean, you just look at it all the way through, whether it's uh, Florida, Georgia, Alabama, I mean, you name it. They've risen to the challenge, and they're going to rise to the challenge again. And it's down there. They're going to be partying on Bourbon Street because LSU's taking it down. They're playing their best football right now. Uh, that's important. Um, not to say Clemson isn't, but we just don't know because of the level of competition. Of course, they were finally able to get that win over a ranked team uh, when they beat uh, Virginia in the ACC title game. Then not uh, had a big win against Ohio State. We can't take that away. But LSU's done it longer. They've done it more consistently. This team is on a mission. We talked about the offense. You know those names, but how about this defense that's gotten better? This is a uh, a defense that gave up a lot of points early in the season to, to teams like Vanderbilt. But I think the key is at the back end of that defense, Derek Stingley Jr. He's the best uh, true freshman in the country and <laughs> by far. And you just think about Grant Delpit, who uh, Ed O'Dron at SEC Media Day said he's the best player he's ever coached. This LSU defense is gelling and it's coming around. That's why LSU is going to win and buy a lot of points. Yeah, they're going to be able to slow down Trevor Lawrence, Travis Etienne, uh, Higgins out there. Just what Clemson wants to do. Now, they do have to watch out, uh, as we saw against Ohio State, with the play breaking down and Lawrence being able to use his legs and being able to escape and not just make a play or get the sticks. Take it to the house from distance. So that's something that could keep Clemson in this game early on uh, if things aren't working out there, which they expect to with their wide receivers, with the running game. If LSU is putting their clamps down early, Trevor Lawrence running could be uh, the kind of the X factor that uh, some people aren't taking into account for this game. Well, we're going to keep this podcast active. Of course, you know, the, the, the weekly shows may, may or may not come as frequently because obviously with the season ending on Monday, um, we're going to be looking at stuff like recruiting and uh, spring football coming up. Of course, there's that. So we're going to keep active as much as we can, of course, here on the Saturday Supremacy Podcast. We have a film called Saturday Supremacy to edit that was first a film, now a podcast. Hope you'll subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, or Spotify. Any way you choose to take in the show, uh, we're so excited to be able to bring you um, our second SEC football documentary. That's where the you know genesis of this podcast came from was this film that we've worked on for the last couple of years, and it's still ongoing. Hope to have it uh, complete here in the next year or so. But uh, our experiences in the SEC going to a game each week is really the precipice for this podcast. And that's why we wanted to, to do this. Not, not only talk about the games and the players and the coaches and the things that we cover when we go to SEC media days and, and we do interviews throughout the year, but our experiences from being around these programs, from attending games at these very special places. LSU is one that stands out as being so special to us over the years. And now we are so um, happy for LSU, uh, just pleased with the season they've had with Coach Ed Ogeron, what he's been able to do, Joe Burrow winning the Heisman. Best of luck to them, man. Yeah, absolutely. Best of luck to them. And uh, we love catching up with them at SC Media Days, and they're great people. So obviously we wish them the best moving forward. And we're looking forward to next season. I know this season's not over yet. We're not looking past it. But just with Lane Kiffin at Ole Miss and Mike Leach at uh, Mississippi State now, that's kind of breaking news uh, as we come here later in the week. And and so we're looking forward to next year and uh, getting to meet them in SEC Media Days and just kind of the storylines and what's going into uh, the SEC in 2020. 
College football may be coming to an end here this Monday night in New Orleans, but we're just getting started here on the Saturday Supremacy Podcast. Thank you so much. Hope you guys enjoy the game. Uh, it's always great to see college football showcased in the manner that it deserves, and you can say what you want about the regular season, about the bowl games. This is what matters. This is the pinnacle, and it's all taking place Monday night in the Big Easy. Come on, come so I'll sit back watching the LSU Tigers, right? And the announcers say, man, the LSU wide receivers just broke Michael Clay's record. I say, ooh. Prime time, tiger time, this for LSU. We number one going dumb, hit the gritty. Coach O, buy you boys, do what tigers do. Time to open up the cage, let the tiger loose. Run, tiger, run, this for LSU. Run, tiger, run, this for LSU. We number one going dumb, and we jigging too. They let the tigers through, and now we get loose. Run, Tiger, run, this for LSU. Run, Tiger, run, this for LSU. We number one going dumb and we jigging too. They let the Tigers through and now we getting loose. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Do the Wild Tiger. Feel my roar. Feel my roar. Feel my roar. Come on, come on, come on, come on. started off Monday knowing we're going to win this game. Go Tigers.